a missile test, the voter data spat, and CNN blackmail. I'm Adam Bierne, and this is The Square Circle. If you have a passion for helping people, want to launch a new charity, or need to raise funds, Voluntary Solutions can help. You have a passion for helping people, we have a passion for helping you. Visit VoluntarySolutionsDC.com, 844-739-5488. Hello and welcome to The Square Circle. I'm your host, Adam Bierne. Joining us today are Bill Buck of Buck Communications, Matthias Holt of the Institute for Liberty, and Sasha Kaplan from Jewish Politics. Welcome, everybody. North Korea launched its most provocative missile test yet this week. Here's the story from ABC News. U.S. officials confirmed tonight this launch appears to be a major breakthrough, a North Korean two-stage intercontinental ballistic missile. Supervising it all, Kim Jong-un. It's a missile which could potentially reach the U.S. The missile reached 1,700 miles high, landing in the water 577 miles to the east in the Sea of Japan, angering the Japanese. Experts believe such a missile might be able to reach Alaska. So President Trump has declared that the era of strategic patience with North Korea is over. Sasha Kaplan, what can we do to avoid this turning into a war? Well, right now, the uh, United States of the Security Council at the United Nations has asked for a vote, which will hopefully increase sanctions, but I don't think that'll do much. North Korea has gone back and forth on sanctions all the time, and clearly, this hasn't done a lot. I would love to see a little bit more cooperation with China, a little bit more aggressive cooperation, because they are in a position to influence North Korea and prevent them from doing this, and it doesn't seem like they're particularly interested in doing it. That's true, Bill, but President Xi visited President Trump at Mar-a-Lago, the president making much of their personal connection, but it doesn't seem to be making much difference. Yeah, in a shocking development, the leader of China does not see advancing America's national interests as being their primary interest. China's going to do what's in their interest with Korea. They do not want a unified Korea on their border. They know that the idea of an American first strike is off the question, out of the question. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a question of how much pain we're willing to take on economically versus China. There are some things that we can do as far as dealing with the Chinese banks um, because China is basically the, the sponsor of North Korea. But outside of that, there is not much, unfortunately, that, that we can do. We ha the, there are so many people that live within you know, a 35-mile 35 miles of the North Korean border, you've got American troops, you've got over 100,000 Americans living there. They are all under extreme threat. So we, we need to find a way to, um, to try and get some other folks on our side on this. But the biggest question is how, uh, how Trump will be able to work with the president of China. And I don't know that sending out a tweet asking if the North Korean leader doesn't have anything better to do with his life, is really going to solve the problem. Well, it does seem to be North Korea's strategy to get to having a nuclear weapon. Mithi, so do you agree with these two that China's the solution here, and what more can President Trump do? <laughs> um, so I think that the important Trump tweet to look at here is not the one about whether Kim Jong-un has anything better to do, which frankly strikes me as useful, demeaning your enemy is useful. But the more important point was his repeated tweets saying, look, we tried it China's way, they couldn't do anything, so we're going to do things our way. Bill's correct. China will not advance United States interests on their own. They have to be forced into doing it. President Trump has leverage to be able to do that. It's actually kind of funny. Uh, earlier this week, there was a story that uh, Russia and China are announcing they're trying to come up with a deal for how to handle North Korea. Everybody seems to want to be seen to be doing something about North Korea. No one's actually doing anything. And Kim Jong-un is making it that much more difficult for them to be seen to do nothing because he very clearly wants to do something, and that something is threaten our sphere of influence. There are things we can do. We could... For example, um, get closer with South Korea. President Trump has been trying to negotiate something like that for uh, the past week. Uh, we could also, and this is the obvious last ditch option, and I'm not suggesting we should do it now, but if we really wanted to spook China, we could let Japan go nuclear. 
And uh, then they would have to deal with having a Western ally on their doorstep already. And the question would be, OK, what do we do? We have to do something to uh, prevent ja Japan going nuclear. So the only option is to have, no have Korea unify under South Korean control and uh, hopefully negotiate some sort of deal to keep nuclear weapons uh, to a minimum there. Because I think at this point, the only option we have is to see is to play chicken with China. Who's going to fight first? Who's going to be able be willing to take a stand? Because quite frankly, we can't afford to have North Korea able to hit us with a nuke any more than they can be afford to have South Korea able to hit them with a nuke. And Sasha Kaplan, do you think the spread of nuclear weapons in the region is a potential option? I think there's always the potential for it because you know we're not the only countries who have them. We're n and other countries are developing them. You know, Iran is as well, and they all have their own uses and their own desires for them. The question is, is what is the ultimate goal for China, for Japan, with those nuclear weapons? I don't know how keen Japan is anymore to develop nuclear weapons, given mm -hmm. Fukushima and their own rec recent issues. But I, th I, I agree with Matthias that it, it's, it, it would be a game changer, and it could force China's hand. Because I don't understand why China wouldn't, would want North Korea to be a powerful person and to have these kind of t issues, because all this does is continue the influx of refugees entering the country, China illegally from North Korea. If the North Korean threat is not as imminent or if, God willing, something changes in the country, there would be, not that that's likely, there would be a change and there would be less problems of refugees and illegal entry into, the, into China. Does anybody here think that some sort of conflict is inevitable? Uh, I don't. Um, one, I think the idea of a nuclear Japan is a fantasy. It's sort of it, it, it's not going to happen. It's all, it's not on the table. Um, the same idea with a unified Korea. China is not going to stand for a unified Korea. There is absolutely no way in the world China is going to let that happen. I think, you know, the only things that we can hope for are that China in some way cuts off this nuclear problem and incentivizes North Korea to, to stop, or eventually we may have to accept North Korea into the nuclear club. I think that their, the interest in joining the nuclear club is not necessarily in using it. I think it's the ultimate goal for them is maintaining their regime and maintaining control of North Korea. I'm not comfortable with the idea of North Korea going nuclear. I think it's, you know, You've got a really crazy person with very little control over him with a very, very, you know, deadly weapon within striking distance of millions of people. But, you know, it, nobody's come up with a solution in 25 years, and they seem to be within, you know, 18 months of having this capability. So the one shot is China. The question is, can we get the money? So, um, Matthias Holt, just quickly then, if... Uh the United States, are they pushing North Korea towards a nuclear weapon? Can you understand why the North Koreans would want nukes? I don't consider it my job to empathize with vile dictators like Kim Jong-un, and I don't care what we're pushing him to do. Quite frankly, the fact that we're now 18 months away means there's the urgency to maybe develop a solution. And quite frankly, much as I appreciate that the Obama foreign policy of leading from behind still lives in some quarters, I'm glad that we have a president who's not going to sit back and say, oh, let China do it on their terms. No, we force their hand to do something, or we go in and handle the problem ourselves. But that's exactly what Trump asked China to do. To d he tried to outsource this policy to China. You you are literally accusing and it didn't work. some. You know, forget about Obama. Right, it didn't work. He so was, now we're doing it, something so different. Trump, Trump was leading. We from tried behind. it your way. We tried letting China have all the leverage. It, we're not going to do that anymore. Okay, Janice. Well, we will see where it goes from here, where President Trump takes it now. But. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to remind our viewers that you can submit your questions to our guests through our website, www.publicsquare.net, and we'll answer as many as we can live on air towards the end of the show. Also this week, President Trump's newly created Voter Fraud Commission got off to a rocky start. Here's NBC News' coverage. Tonight, growing backlash against a sweeping request from President Trump's commission investigating alleged voter fraud. This is an outrageous attempt by this administration to suppress voters, to disenfranchise voters. 
That outrage following this letter asking all 50 states to provide their voter data, names, addresses, dates of birth, party affiliations, and even, in some cases, the last four digits of social security numbers. The request comes from the commission's vice chair, Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach. My question to them is, what are you afraid of? All it is is publicly available information. We're going to analyze it and present that information to the public. So, Bill Buck, why don't these states, even Republican states, not want to give up their data? Because they hate America. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's because Fake Chris Kobach has created a bar to which he knows that no state, or maybe Kansas and no other state, um, is going to follow. There, there's plenty of publicly available information on plenty of publicly available voter information. They ask for a whole bunch of things that they don't need, or they can go to Experian or some other, you know, free market company and buy this data. But states are not going to turn over this data, nor should they. Why it, not? Because it Why violates not? state law. And we are a country that is supposed to respect states' rights, the last time I checked. But okay. isn't... I, I'm sorry, but the Clinton gaslighting is still on, <laughs> I see. Let's talk about what Kobach wait, actually wait requested. Second, I'm sorry, Bill. No. You've pl you've said no, plenty, was, Bill. No, but that was low and inconsiderate and inexcusable. I'm sorry for hurting your feelings. No, that's an inappropriate way to speak to another you person. You just lied. You just said that this was inappropriate and somehow against state law. Kobach requested their publicly available data. He could have bought it for 20 bucks from every single one of those states. If you're going to turn around and say this is against state law to offer stuff that's already available to the public, I'm not going to sit here and take it. I'm well, sorry. Not, not everything on that list was available to the public. And states are within, first of all, it was a request. States are within their rights to say no. I'm not arguing that they hate America, that they shouldn't necessarily say that was all of this. Of course I know it was sarcasm. Well, you seem to need it pointed out to you. Oh, uh, you seem to need it pointed out to you that when you say something that is provably false, you're not allowed to get away with it. I'm sorry, but your Clinton tactics don't work. Well, uh, I know that, uh, I'm not sure about every state, but the state of Maryland claimed in their response that it was indeed illegal to, against their state law, to give out this information. And, but know, if we let Sasha Kaplan have her, apparently. if we let Sasha have her say on this, so from what I understand, some of the data that he asked for is not something that's even collected in terms of voting data. So that's obviously that's not, not something he's going to get. And I think Matthias is right. It's just a request. No one is forcing them to give this data. They are free to not give out the data or free to give some, out some of this data. But a lot of this data, as I understand it, is publicly available. You can purchase it. And it just seems like Trump is just going to the source. Some of his requests I do have some issues with, but overall, looking at it completely, it's, it's not quite as awful and illegal and frightening as some make it out to be. And I'm not familiar with Maryland's state law regarding voter collection information. No, me neither. That's the reason that they gave. And neither am I, so I can't say whether it's Clinton gaslighting yet. I <laughs> presume not, because, yeah. But isn't there the argument here that this voter fraud commission is almost a fraud in itself? It's not actually about investigating voter fraud. This is about potentially trying to deny people the right to vote. How so? Well, that's the, the argument that people are making is that they're worried that this will be about bringing in greater voter ID laws, greater scrutiny of voter registration, and therefore it's about denying people the right to vote. I, I've talked a little bit about the issue of, you know, voter ID laws and how they've been portrayed. And I don't think it's completely unreasonable for to let states make their own decisions on whether or not to require voter ID. I know I need an ID when I go to a bar or when I need just about anything from anyone in a professional or government environment. So why don't I need an Why should I need an ID to vote? Because most, I'd say the majority of people regardless of where they're from, need that. But the issue here is, are, is there, are there individuals in states who are e voting without actually being able to vote? People who are not citizens of this country or who are not even here legally or whether they're criminals. And I think that this was something that has come up enough in the last, what, three elections that it is something that should be looked into indefinitely. Coming so, up because it's been raised by a number of people or coming up because there are provable cases where Both. this is happening? Both. How, 
how many provable cases where this is happening are there? I'm not a numbers person. I'm afraid I can't tell you that off the, the top of my head. Well, I can. Okay. Um, <laughs> Pew did a study back in 2012, I believe it was 2012, where they found that there are currently 1.75 million dead people still on the voter rolls. Fact. Now, if Kobach wanted to clean that up, I think there's plenty of reason for him to do that. And furthermore, there have been studies but, done. But um, how many of those people voted? We don't know, because that's the fun thing about voting. It's a secret ballot. But, no, they, but, uh, but who shows up to vote is not a secret. Uh, people can show up and claim different identities than they have. I'm not sure if this whole voter ID thing... like. But if the dead, the dead person would be shown as voting then? Yes, and that's the problem, is that people... If you don't think dead people vote in Chicago, I have a bridge to sell you. Like, there's plenty of the, people who vote they who don't. claim to have different identities. They from don't, the, and you don't have a bridge. It's not, but it's not true. It doesn't happen. It does happen. It does uh, particularly happen. In, there are provable cases. There are. Okay. There's so, a case of in Indiana of a Republican, uh, like, sheriff who actually lived in Illinois but was voting in Indiana. Okay, Steve Bannon was illegally registered in Florida. I know. I don't know if he voted there or not. But but if these things actually happened and actually existed, there's enough of a paper trail that people could put numbers behind it. They can't. Yes, there are dead because people. Because no one's yes. done the investigation yet. Okay, if I can just very quickly ask... Which is what Kobox for. If I can very quickly ask a yes oh, or no question shit. just before we uh, move on. This, of course, Voter Fraud Commission came about when President Trump claimed that he had actually won the popular vote, had it not been for these illegal votes. So if we do a quick yes or no, do we believe the president on that? I don't know, because we haven't actually done the study yet. I'd love to see what happens if these states would stop withholding their data. I don't think it really matters. I think, yeah. you know, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the popular vote doesn't decide the presidency. The electoral vote does. And... You know, maybe that's just wishful thinking on his part. Maybe he just wanted to boast and say, look, I won the popular vote. It doesn't matter, though. He's still president, and nothing's going to change that. Okay, so not quite a yes or no, but uh, President Trump, did he win the popular vote? Yes no. or no? No. No, no from Bill Buck. Okay. Well, we will move on to our final topic, which is on CNN. They've been in the news because they've become the news story themselves this week. Here is that story from Watch It. Hashtag CNN blackmail started trending late Tuesday after conservative commentators alleged that the network threatened to reveal the identity of the anonymous Redditor who apologized Tuesday for creating the video of President Trump beating up a man with a CNN logo superimposed on his head. Many online critics interpreted a statement in CNN reporter Andrew Kaczynski's story, how CNN found the Reddit user behind the Trump wrestling gif to mean the network would identify hashtag Han solo if he backtracks his apology or creates another post that CNN deems offensive. So were CNN really trying to threaten the person who made this, Jeff, or was it just clumsy communications, Matthias Holt? Oh, they were trying to threaten him. I mean, it's obvious. They, I think that it's pretty obvious, in fact, given that everybody on both sides of the aisle seems to be against this, except not coincidentally CNN anchors are against this. Um, and I will pay Bill this much of a compliment, I think that he's probably intellectually honest enough to uh, be in the same boat on that, because liberalism, at last I checked, was protecting viewpoints you disagree with. And quite frankly, this is uh, a classic case of a supposedly supposed to be liberal institution uh, betraying its mission and running around trying to treat some random private citizen who happened to get picked up by the President of the United States through no request, through no asking of his own, and uh, trying to turn him into a public figure because they can't smear the man in the White House. I mean, they try, of course, but he'll, he'll actually punch back and has the resources. This poor guy, whoever he is, doesn't have the resources to do that. And it's extraordinarily shameful, I think, no matter what this person may or may not have posted, no matter what kind of person they are, for a news organization to run around blackmailing innocent people um, and saying, look, we will only withhold your identity so long as you don't trigger us with your mean words. But isn't it the case that they could have just named him if they wanted? They could have they named doing, him. And you know what? That thing? would have been, if they'd named him, that would have at least been an honest exercise of journalism. Um, I think it would have still been wrong because I think the practice of publicly shaming private citizens uh, who have absolutely no public presence whatsoever beyond anonymous posts on a subreddit is frankly disgusting. But if they wanted to do that, it would have been a lot more defensible than, oh, we're withholding his ID so long as he doesn't offend us. So, Bill Buck, did you see it as a threat? Is this a CNN own goal in terms of their communications? I think they've got a tough call in figuring out what they need to do to feel like they're protecting their reporters. They obviously felt like this was 
some sort of threat and in an era where journalists are being assaulted by political candidates and you know threatened at political rallies I can see how they feel under under threat um, I think to call this blackmail is kind of silly I you know they didn't post post this person's information I think trying to police be people being stupid and juvenile on the internet is an unending task and it's kind of silly for them to get into that game but I do understand the need you know for people to feel like for people in newsrooms to feel like people have their back um, the real the real problem here is you know the president's inability to control his impulses and to to tweet something like that is it's just Trump's so fault beneath <laughs> no one would know who this person was were it not for Donald Trump why and, do they have to know who he is? No one would care if not for we'll, CNN turning this into a giant spectacle. And perhaps we'll get onto that, but Sasha Kappel, how did you see CNN's actions? Generally not a great it's, journalistic principle no, to become the story. No, this is childish. This is, you know, <laughs> 20 years ago, you could say, like, you, you could proudly say that you watch CNN and you got great grippling news stories. Now, it's like, you know, you put a hat and you're just hiding. It's like, no, I don't watch CNN. Because this is a very serious thing that they did. And as someone who is on the internet through my blog and my writing, who does post things that are somewhat unpopular, sometimes among certain political views, that kind of, it's, it's very scary, regardless of where you are in the, uh, on the political spectrum, to have your identity dangled in front of you. And I actually did have a friend who was, quote unquote, doxxed because someone did not like what she had to say. Correct. And it doesn't matter how radical she is or was perceived or not. You can't, it, she was put in great danger. Her family was put in great da danger. And that is not okay. And the fact that CNN, who is supposed to be a professional journalistic network, to do something so childish and immature, it makes me glad I don't watch CNN. Okay, well, perhaps if we move away from CNN and to the wider issue of the post itself, the original post, the person that CNN are allegedly threatening, made this video and it was silent. Which means Correct. that the one that President Trump posted, someone took it, managed to sync it up with the original audio from the original programming, and for President Trump to have posted it from his phone would then have had to send it to the president for him to be able to post it on Twitter. So is the wider issue here about who is taking this meme that's come from Reddit and turning it into something to send it to the president's iPhone for him to post to Twitter. It's not like this guy found the, twi the you know, the president's secret email account and sent it to him or anything. It's probably, you know, someone saw it online, thought it was funny and emailed it to the president. The president thought it was funny and emailed it to him. And it's funny. It it's is. It's not classy it, it, or anything, it, it, but it's what funny. What he's saying is it was altered between the time that it was posted. Oh, no, that's yeah, true. The, the, sure. Yeah, that's they're, they're, it's not the but, original post. By, 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 you know. We don't know who did well, it, actually. Don't know who it it may have been a guy in Mexico is what one of the stories. But perhaps that will be no the idea. next thing that, that comes out on this particular story. Yeah. So, yes. uh, so now it's time for our regular segment, which is the most underreported story of the week. And who would like to start? Okay, well, well we're going to take our viewer questions first, actually, and we're going to go to... Tracy Morris, who says that if China wanted to stop North Korea's missile program, it could do so easily. I think you've all agreed on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So doesn't this suggest that China is using North Korea as a pawn, Sasha? That's a very complicated question. I think it wants to, it wants to use North Korea as a pawn, and maybe to some degree it is. The question is how long that's going to last and how much is China going to get out of it? Because... While North Korea's leader may, may be a very childish-like guy, he's still the leader of a nation that he has vast control and power over, and he's not going to be playing the fiddle for very long if he's still doing it, or at least China thinks he is. So I think if China, if some steps are not taken to stop him, I don't think he's going to be under China's thumb for long. Okay, well, we'll I know you all want to jump in, but we have to move on quickly to our next question because we've been talking so sure. much about our previous topics. And this one comes from Damon Cobb, who says that, and it's on this voter data issue, if the voter data is publicly available information, then why can't someone just go and pick it up and deliver it to Chris Kobach? I think we were covering that point. 
That's a totally valid argument. And I actually, this is something that I wanted to say during the whole thing, I don't know why they didn't just buy it off of Experian or someplace like that. It seems like sending this request was inviting needless amounts of controversy, except for the states that don't have this sort of thing um, completely publicly available, in which case it's not a publicly available request. So why ask only for the publicly available data? It does seem like much ado about nothing to me. That's, mm. that's what I was going to say. Thanks oh. for backing me up there. <laughs> okay, well, now we will head to our most under-reported under story of of the week. And given that these two got the questions, Bill Buck, we'll start with you. All right. I'm going to start with um, tomorrow's bilateral meeting between Putin and Trump. Um, I think what is, um, isn't being discussed enough is the fact that people in the White House were leaking their concern that there wouldn't be enough people in the room. And it turns out it's only going to be Trump, Tillerson, and uh, one U.S. interpreter. And when you have staff in the White House concerned that there aren't enough people to be there next to Trump when he meets with Putin, people should be a lot more concerned about this than they are. And people should be talking about it a lot more than they are. Okay. Well, I'm sure you would love to jump in, but let's move on to your underreported gonna... story, Sasha. Sure. Uh, just the, uh, yesterday, in a UNESCO meeting in Poland, the um, Israeli ambassador asked for a moment of silence because this was Poland for the victims of the Holocaust. Very nice moment, the chair agreed, and it was over. Not to be undone, the ambassador from Cuba decided that this was a perfect time to get on a soapbox and state that the chair did not, that the ambassador from Israel did not have the authority to call for a moment of silence, he just asked for one. And that instead, we should also, again, hold a moment of silence for the victims of the of uh, Palestinians who died in the region. First of all, as far as I know, no Palestinians died in Poland. Someone can correct me. But this just proves that anti-Semitism is still alive and well at UNESCO and that everything, no matter how much, has to do with actual victims of the Holocaust is not relevant unless we make it about the Palestinians. Okay. Lithius Holt, your most underreported The UN is anti-Semitic. What a shocker. No, I mean, I think the actual underreported story, you could just umbrella all of this under anything not having to do with President Trump's Twitter account would be probably the underreported story. Um, but if I had to pick one, I'd say uh, I mentioned the South Korean deal with the president in passing during our first segment. But I think uh, this deal, this tra new trade deal they're trying to set up, they've been talking about it for the past six days. And now that they're at the G20, thankfully, some coverage is starting to trickle in. But there's been no real look at what the contours of this might be or what it might look like. And frankly, if you don't have South Korea, who do you have? There needs to be some look at how that alliance is being built. Yeah, well, this president's Twitter account certainly will be something that keeps us busy, I'm sure. And maybe we'll get on to some other issues. But uh, that is actually it from us for this week. I'm Adam Beer. Thank you for watching The Square Circle. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.